This is kelp, six meters long, 30 centimeters wide. It is one blade grown within the space of one year from the size of a pencil to this size. I discovered this brown algae as a material when I was artist in residence in Japan in 2007. Kelp is farmed and eaten all across Asia, but also here. We consume it every day in toothpaste, in ice cream, as a gelling agent. It makes our hair look shiny when we use it in shampoo. Um, it, makes us, it makes it possible for us to swallow our pills as kelp casings. We never really think of it. But what fascinated me about kelp were not the derivatives. It was the material qualities that I found it had. It can be shiny and have a depth of color like lacquerware. It can be translucent, like stained glass. It can act and feel like leather, like parchment, plastic, and veneer. It can be like a textile. I was amazed to hear that nobody was using it in that way to hear that people were only seeing it as food. And I decided I would start working with it as a material. I kind of knew that to do this, I needed to combine the knowledge of many different people and areas. I needed to find biologists, chemists, scientists. Um, I needed to work with engineers. I needed to bring together all these people to learn for me about different seaweed species, to learn about their habitats, to learn about how to, I don't know, process them, how to um, develop them, tensile strength and so forth. So I could definitely not do this by myself. South Kensington is full of people who make new knowledge on a daily basis and who are willing to share it if you ask. I had studied design products at the Royal College of Art, so I was well aware of all the magnificent institutions in its vicinity. The Natural History Museum was my first port of call for information on seaweed. This is um, fabric. There I looked at pressed specimens. I kind of learned the differences between Laminaria digitata and Saccharina longissima, and I met Professor Juliet Brody, their, si their scientist who works with seaweed. I explained to her how I thought we could make all these wonderful things out of seaweed, and she said, oh. <laughs> and I said, oh? Well, it sounds wonderful what you're saying, but mm, I worry, because everything we use on a very large scale as, as humans, we tend to mess up irrevocably. So brown seaweed has a hard time as it is. It brings me to responsibility. Every day we transform nature into artifice, and with each of these transformations comes responsibility. The responsibility to tr transform it into an artifice worthy of its origins, and the responsibility to do so without degrading the ecosystem it comes from. Above all, I realized that to do this research, I needed to kind of work in depth. I needed time, and I needed to concentrate on my, my subject. So thanks to an HRC research award, um, I am developing this as a PhD between the Royal College of Art and the Victorian Albert Museum. I'm currently designer in residence at the V&A, though what I tell people is that I am the head of the Department of Seaweed. <laughs> In my department, we don't just show objects that exist already, but we make them. We make objects from kelp, and we share the entire process from material to finished object with the audience, with the visitors that come into the museum. 
Visitors become contributors, whether they come in for a few minutes or whether they come in for a few months. The museum acts as a rock pool for us, sheltering us from the breakers of the open ocean, but also allowing us to develop and play, to really create freely. The tide is coming in. My time at the v &A is almost over, but the Department of Seaweed will continue. We will continue to link up individuals and institutions in, to find new uses for kelp. Think of all the materials around us. Think of what we could make from them. Seaweed is powerful, but the other materials are powerful too, if we learn to really value them. Thank you.